Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Bell Ringers podcast. I'm Colin Daly alongside Benjamin Goldstein. Oh, Phillies are skidding a little bit, almost as much as that relief pitcher Jorge Lopez in the Mets. I don't know if that's a fair comparison. He's uh, he's on his he's on his own type of struggle bus. We're on the uh, the 26 man struggle bus. He's on the one man struggle bus. But um, what's going on, Ben? Where's his Phillies offense? Are, it's the best offense. Phillies are losing. The offense yeah, is are. dead. The Phillies are losing. Cremation. <laughs> um, they we predicted them. I predicted them to go five and one on the road trip. I think you said four and two. They went two and four. So uh, you were closer than I was. Um, okay. lost two of three in Colorado. Lost two of three in San Francisco. And kind of the offense was the kind of the story. They lost in extra innings on Friday, three to two. They there was no offense on Saturday until the ninth inning where they came back. Um, lost five two on Sunday in Colorado. Monday in San Francisco they lost eight to four. They got walked off on again on Tuesday when they lost one nothing. And then Sunday the offense came alive again. Um, or should I say Wednesday the offense came. Monday Wednesday the offense came alive again. Um, I mean, here's my thought process with it. It's baseball. You're not your offense is not going to be there every single night, and the people that are freaking out about this need to realize that the season, while the Phillies may be playing good for the first time in May and forever, the season is still 162 games long. They're not going to yeah. play. They're not going to hit over 250 as a team throughout the season. They're going to have we- game. They're going to have series like this. To put the season into human perspective, we haven't even really hit the teenager part of the season yet. We're still like we just finished being a toddler. No, uh, we we're a third a, of the way through. Yeah, so you I mean you've got like the young kids? I, okay, I guess we, we're a teenager. We'll go with that. We're like eighteen, nineteen. When the, we're but we're not on the back nine yet. The back nine is when things get serious, right? Your August baseball, your September baseball. You've got a good amount of games scheduled against division rivals. Braves, do we put the Mets in there? I don't know. We do play the Mets at a good good amount toward the end, but I don't know if they count. They're I mean, pretty they're useless right, these days, so. aren't they? Yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah. yeah, we've got a lot to talk about with them. They are uh, – they're something. But, yeah, this offense, Colin, just – the pitching was good. Uh, Tom and Walker was meh. Uh, on Monday, but the other than that, the pitching was great. Zach Wheeler was excellent Tuesday. Christian, Christopher Sanchez was excellent Wednesday. Just the offense couldn't really do anything. And how many times have we said that when they're on the West Coast? When haven't we said that when they're on the West Coast? They're they're abysmal out there. I don't know what it is. You got all the sunshine, got the waves, the salt water air. I don't know if there's anything to complain about when you're out there, but McCovey Cove is beautiful. It. Colorado, I mean Colorado, the mountains are gorgeous. Just Might be cold there. Elevation. Maybe they had trouble breathing. You know, when you get up high, maybe they probably. Them, we should send them a pack of oxygen masks. They have like a, you know how like some teachers have their Amazon wish list. Maybe we should make a Phillies wish list and have everything get shipped to Citizens Bank Park. A Phillies wish list, a World Series. Yeah. Right. Maybe we can buy them some some cork, put them in their bats, some uh, never spider tack. All right, huh. now we're we're not cheating though. We're just playing baseball. No, we're just encouraging our team to be there, be at their best. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I've got my high school baseball coach says if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So. That's true. That's true. Hey, Why do you guys cheat? Means. No, no, we don't. I mean. <laughs> You can cheat and you can bend the rules. Okay. The rules are meant to be bent, not broken. Like, in fact, I've got a bendy pen right now, bendy pencil right now. You ever gotten these? Bick makes them. Bendy pencil. I have. I I've, I've never had one, but I've used one. They're kind of interesting. Yeah. Anyway, back it's to baseball. Meant to be bent, but not meant to be broken. Then it becomes dysfunctional. Just like cheating. <laughs> the game I want to highlight the most, I think, is Tuesday. Um, if I can, when was that Tuesday? Well, was, that, was that the? Oh, that was that one. The Phillies lost one to nothing in extra innings, which I mean, I can't even imagine being there. Um, just a tough one, you know. Uh, one nothing loss. Um, 
Kyle Schwarber 0 for 4 or 2 for 4. JT Muto 1 for 5. Bryce Harper 0 for 3. Nick Cassianos 1 for 4. Stott 0 for 2. Sosa 0 for 2. Um, Marsh 0 for 4. Clemens 0 for 4. Rojas 1 for 3. Um, Boom came in a pinch Stott? hit. Bryson Stott's in a funk. Uh, and so he is Bryce been Harper. Like, oh yeah, but specifically looking at uh, what's his face? Stott. He has been like Reese Hoskins level. <laughs> He's been on a Reese Hoskins level roller coaster this season. Like yeah, he started, started off really off, slow and now really hot. And you and couldn't then... stop him. He was hitting like 500 for two weeks, and then he can't hit again, and he can't field now too. I think he has like two errors in the last week, which isn't. It's nothing crazy. I mean, we saw Alec Bohm have three in one game, but you know, Bryson Stott, he's one of the best fielders in the league. I genuinely, I think he's the best fielder on the team. I don't think it's actually close to tell you the truth. I think that he is. By far the most, de- the best defender on the Phillies. Um, I think Edmundo Sosa is up there, but I'd say Stott's number one. And two errors in a week for him is very uncharacteristic of Bryson Stott. Um, he's still not striking out a ton, but it, it seems like he's getting under the ball a little bit, which I think is kind of strange because he's never been a guy who's really tried to hit the ball in the air a lot. Um, and because, you know, the hits that he does have, they're, they're bloopers. And it seems to be low pitches that he's kind of just golfing into the outfield, um, sneaking it over the second baseman's head or, you know, a blooper that falls, you know, in the Bermuda Triangle there. So he has had a strange season, I think. Um, you know who hasn't really good, though, is J.T. Real Muto. Yeah, I want to quickly back. quickly stay on Stott. His last seven games, he's three for 26 with no RBIs. He's walked only once. He struck out only four times. That's a slash line of 115, 148, 115. Ooh. Average the same as the slugging, which isn't great. His last 15 games, his yeah, slash is 180, 300, 240. This Giants series, he wasn't good. He had the off day on Monday. Tuesday, he was 0 for 4. Uh, Wednesday, he was 2 for 5. Um, struck out once in both of those games. Um, just tough. For, I mean, you're mentioning Reese Hoskins. Which is I feel which is kind of tough because I mean the They're guy was the most up and down player ever. Um but Stott, yeah, I mean, kind of been that way up and down. Just getting under the ball. It's you know, it is it, it kind of is what it on the season, um his average is two fifteen, uh two forty nine. So Yeah, I wouldn't have foreseen that. But no, Bryce Harper has looked lost the last couple of days. Like yeah, I mean, yes, um, yesterday, which um, was Wednesday, he freaked out. He slammed his bat um, against the um, against the wall in the clubhouse. Um, he got forced, uh, got thrown at twice in the head in the same game. Bench is cleared. You saw a little Pat Burrell shoving a little bit. Um, yeah, what was Harper? That? <laughs> he was know, our, bad. It's, our- Pat Burrow. Top dog back in the day. Well, draft uh, at least. Harper in the last in his last week, four for twenty-four, a homer, five RBIs, walked three times, struck out eight, slash line one sixty seven, two fifty nine, two ninety two. Not Bryce Harper numbers, Colin. No, not at all. And I'll tell you, he still has some of the best numbers on the team, but it is weird to see him not performing up to his standards. And you know, his standards are gonna be a lot higher than the rest of the guys on the team. Season veteran, he's won two MVPs. He actually has not played an All Star game with the Phillies, and I really want to see that happen this year. I think that'll it change will this year. because a couple, a lot of the National League first baseman haven't been great this year. I also think it's a lot harder to make the All Star team as an outfielder than it is in the infield because most teams really only have one guy for each infield position, or some teams have four out. Like we have, probably, I think we have four qualified outfielders. I would imagine that Rojas, Marsh, Castellanos, and I would think Pache is – he hasn't been on the injured list this year, has he? That was last year he was on there a bunch. He, I bet he's qualified um, for the stat line. Um, so, and especially a lot of, you know, a lot of your outfielders are not the most athletic guys. Um, they're your best hitters, right? Like, and you kind of just put them in the outfield because they can, you know, catch a fly ball and run a little bit. Um <laughs> 
Kyle or Silver you have guys like Johan Rojas who are insanely athletic and great defensively and struggle to play. And unfortunately, those guys aren't valued as much, and they're never going to make the All Star team. Like you're never going to see. Unfortunately, you'll probably never see Johan Rojas in an All Star team. You'd have to hit at least 300 to even be considered, just because of the way you know offense is valued more than defense. Um, but especially for All Star games and fan vote and right, all that. Yeah, stuff. that's the main thing there. Um, but definitely being at first base gives Bryce Harper a little bit more of an advantage than he's had in the past. Um, and as long as this skid doesn't continue for too long, and he picks it back up to at least where he usually is, you know, three hits every 10 at-bats, home run here and there, getting extra base hits, walking, you know, keeping the ball on a flat plane, not popping it up, then I think he should be at least a reserve in the All-Star game. He had a horrific first four at-bats yesterday. Um Five, he ended it with a base hit for an RBI to the opposite field, so that was encouraging. And he, he like his strike two swing yesterday. He then looked like he was in some pain um, after his first at bat where he swung at strike two, and then there was throw to first that he like didn't go down on. He didn't look good and went down into the clubhouse. Came back, stayed in the game. Obviously, no problems because we didn't hear anything about it after it. Um, Maybe you need to go to the bathroom. I've been there. Uh, anyway. Got to do, got to do. But um, yeah. Are you concerned? No. We had this conversation at least once a season. Maybe not on here, but I've had it so many times. You know, Bryce Harper. This Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper is gonna be fine. Like everyone needs to cool their jets and l- let the two-time MVP be the two-time MVP. Th- there's guys out there who you know have really good stretches and, and they can't sustain it. But then there are guys who have sustained being superstars for so long. The, you know, struggling for an extended period of time is actually unsustainable because they've learned how to, you know, overcome adversity and struggles and, you know, a lack of a lack of offensive production. You know, we've seen guys like I always think of Gene Segura, right? Gene Segura could find ways to shorten his swing and kind of, you know, refine his groove. And Harper can do the same thing, you know, just in a different, slightly different way. Um, that's what makes him so valuable to have on your team because you know that you know you're going to get production out of him, and while it might not be all 162 games, he's not going to be in these funks for long. Yeah, and how about you mentioned JT Romuto? Was it 17 game hitting streak now? Most by a Phillies catcher. Yeah, I think that's 18 then. No, 18. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's either tied for the most. I hold on. Let me look. It's definitely that no, he has the most. I don't know what the number is. He broke the record. Um, I'm just not sure the number. 17 broke the record, but I thought that he bumped it up to 18. Oh no, he didn't play yesterday. That's right. He didn't play yeah. yesterday, so it's 17 yeah, so it's game 17, hitting streak. Which is it's the, the longest ever by a Phillies catcher. In these last 17 games, he's 26 for 74 with five doubles, a triple, and two homers. So I mean the dude's all electric right now. Yeah, he is. I mean, and his swing is so short. It's so short, and it is great to see because that's been the thing with him for so long. He's got that mile-high leg kick. Eventually, he's going to knee himself in the chin one of these days. Um, <laughs> and it's just his timing gets off. His hands get back too far, and then he's got a big old loopy swing. And last couple of weeks, I don't know what it's been, but he's gotten that front foot down on time, and everything behind that stays in sync. And when his swing is in sync – it is so on plane. It is so level. I, I sound like Ben Davis right now because he always talks about being on plane and staying level. So th- that's a low point in my life. Speaking of tangent here, I don't know if anyone saw the Bell Ringers uh, <laughs> absolutely hammered, I think it was. Posted um, something about Ben Davis having a bat. So I quote tweeted that on our, our account and said, if you know, you know, because we always like to do our bringing out the, the mini bat do our Ben Davis impressions, but I won't make anyone suffer through that today. My point, though, is he has been so level, so on plane, and hitting the ball, and he's hitting it hard, too. He is not getting cheap hits. He is crushing the ball. Um, So that's really, really good to see. Speaking of crushing the ball, one guy who isn't doing that is Garrett Stubbs, but he's found a way to get on base recently, too. He actually hit a laser in his first at-bat yesterday. 
um, right to the second baseman. Um, then his second at bat, I don't know if you were watching, because I know it was, you know, during or just after school, he um, he had like a little dinky single. It definitely should not have been a hit, but I guess it makes up for his his probably a hundred mile per hour line out. So it's good to see that he's been able to, you know, I mean, his average has gone up like 50 points in the last two games he's, or last two or three games he's played, which is absurd, but that's what happens. And you, you know, you've only played like a dozen games in a season, probably not even. Um, do you think that JT Realmuto getting some more rest has helped his offensive production? I think when he had those three or four days off after his back thing, it certainly helped him because he has gone ahead in every game since then. Um, yeah. I mean, JT Romito is not young anymore. He's in his 30s, um, and he, he's going to have to have time off. And, I mean, if you look at it right now, it's helping. Um, will this continue throughout the year? No. When you get to October, he's going to play every day. So, I mean – at some point, he's going to start have to playing, be playing more than just five or six times a week. But, I mean, it's helping right now. Um, I think it's still kind of a small sample size. Not more – I mean, if maybe if you stretch him out over the next week or so because um, they're going to have two days off when they go to London next week. So maybe you play him every day up until then maybe, get the two days off. I'm not sure what they'll go, uh, do on that end. But – I mean, if you look at it now, it's helping. Yeah, you're right. This is a long time down the road, but since we're talking about it, I'll go there now. If the Phillies clinch a wild card spot from that point moving forward, I do not think that he should be playing. He'd be playing about 50% of the Phillies games. That's where I would say 50%. Um, you need to have, as much as it sounds ridiculous, if something were to happen to JT Realmuto, you need to have Garrett Stubbs getting consistent reps between now and the playoffs because he is your everyday catcher. You want JT and Stubbs splitting like Stubbs plays no, no, no. the other day? Not now. I'm saying if they clinch a wild card spot later in the season. Oh, well, if they clinch a spot, that's what's going to happen. Right. Because you saw even now, later in the last year, year, last year that didn't really happen. They kept playing JT until they clinched the first wild card spot. Um, they clinched the first wild card spot the night they clinched. They did. Yeah, it happened the same mm-hmm. night. Maybe I'm combining 2022 and 2023. Yeah, that would maybe. Be weird. But I still think they overplayed Real Muto down the stretch last year. They, I would honestly be okay if he played one game in every series. If if they have four or five series at the end of the season where they've already clinched, he plays one game. Well, I don't think you can mess up his routine. He can um, still because... go through the routine without playing. He can hit in the cages. Because, like, like, here's the thing. The offense is – or having to be the DH. That's what he really should do. Because the offense isn't taxing. He knows how to squat in the catcher's position and catch a fastball. Like, he could not practice that, and he'd still be okay defensively. He's going to be okay defensively. But you can find ways to simulate playing a game or to simulate playing a game without actually going on the field and doing it and risking getting hurt, fatigue. Like, he can do a simulated game in practice and still face live pitching. Because, like, because here's the thing. Like, when I play high school baseball, the one thing that drives me crazy is the coaches give us, like, the little lobs, right? And that's that's our hitting practice. And then we have to go and face a guy who's got a 12-6 curveball that drops 18 inches and a fastball that's touching 85. And I've been seeing my 69-year-old coach throw us lobs with his left hand. And he's righty because his right arm is destroyed. So that's not practice. The pitching machine is awful. Whoever invented the pitching machine should get exiled from baseball because wow. it sucks. Because the entire idea of timing up a pitcher gets completely destroyed. You have a guy standing out there going, huh, 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 and then the ball goes. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I hate it. Um, but when you've played 162 games in a season, you know, Ramuto, he'll play 130 of them, 140. If that, he still has the mindset of how to prepare for a game and go out there and play. So he doesn't need like the being in a game situation to maintain that rhythm. He needs this. He needs to maintain that skill set and practice that skill set, which you can do outside of an in-game environment. 
And that's something that the Phillies coaches have to realize is that playing him every day in September does not make sense because he knows how to go through his routine without stepping, you know, behind the plate and in the batter's box for nine straight innings. So I think that's something the Phillies should look into. Um, will they? I don't know. My opinions are relevant, but I, I think it would be huge. Cause I mean, listen, and you mentioned it and it was the first thing you said, and I'm, I didn't even think of it is the fact that this 17 game hitting streak started when he had, you know, after those, was it three days of rest yet or four? Can't remember. Three or four. Three. Yeah. Days. Right after those, you know, that, that those couple days in a row were hit off. And I think if they can kind of, you know, simulate that down the stretch when we reach September, I think they'll be in a, he'll be in a really good spot. Well, I think also by that point, the Phillies could have a week off anyway. Because now with Ronald Acuna Jr. out for the season with his ACL tear, the Phillies have zero excuse to lose this division. Zero. I agree. Um, no Strider, no Acuna. Their Braves are still playing good baseball. And they'll continue to the, do that. Um, yeah, that's the Atlanta Braves. They still have so much talent without the two. But this is the Phillies division to lose now. They have what? I don't – they have a um, – I took six. me to phillies.com. Six game six, – they have a six-game lead, whatever, in the NL East in – we're two days away from June. I mean, June is usually when they pick it up. If the Phillies lose the division, it's going to – I mean, we've seen crazier things. This is yeah, the six Phillies' game division. Yeah, lead now is lose. nothing. It's nothing. But you're t- 100% right. You cannot lose the division. It, it's theirs to lose, really. I mean, it, I'd say it's their two best players, Strider and uh, – sorry. It's their two biggest threats to the Phillies are Acuna and Strider. Not in October. Threats. No, definitely not. <laughs> I do. I, I again. I, we're jumping the gun a bit here, but I have to ask you this question. <sighs> Pays me to say this. It is October, whatever, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Phillies versus Braves in the division series. If the Phillies lose are we accepting the theory of winning the division in the new playoff structure is not actually advantageous no because the that was the braves that the astros won the world series with a week off two years ago so i think maybe the national league but i also just think it's whoever's hot at the time and you saw that with the phillies and that and phillies and diamondbacks the last two years the hottest team wins. Phillies would have won any other division if they weren't in the Braves division. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but you mentioned threatening. Something else that's threatening. Um, this is put up by oh, Phillies Tailgate on Twitter. Yeah. This Phillies rotation stats in May. Zach Wheeler... In 36 and a third innings, had a 2.72 ERA. Aaron Nola, who will pitch on May 31st, so he will be the last pitcher to pitch in May. Uh, in 31 and two thirds innings, a 2.84 ERA. Ranger Suarez, who will pitch on June 1st, uh, 31 innings, 2.32 ERA. Uh, how about Christopher Sanchez? 31 innings pitched, 2.03 ERA, and then Tyler Walker, um, 26 and a third, 4.78 ERA. Um, lots of memes around the tweet. Uh, you got the soldiers, then the clown. You got some editing out time on Walker. Um, When's his face gonna get replaced with Turn uh, Turnbull? When is what? When's he gonna get? When's that little guy? When that, that dude on the right gonna get replaced by Turnbull? I can't even say his name. Uh, I mean, I mean, probably the never. never. So like, yeah, like <laughs> it's, I'm just. I got. I'm not really. I guess that was a rhetorical question. I was more making a point because he. Uh, it's just uninspiring. Yes, that is exactly what he is. He is uninspiring. I'm trying is- to buy myself into the Taiwan Walker thing, and I just can't do it. Watching him pitch is just so uninspiring. 
he doesn't you're that that is you hit the nail on the head i appreciate that he is uh, yeah i there's no better way there is no better word in the english dictionary than uninspiring for tywin walker he's just he's not good everything <laughs> is left over the plate movement is minimal velocity is average on a go- very good day very good day for him his velocity is average his splitter is not consistent and is really really easy for lefties and righties to hit when it's not down in the zone and you know where it's not been ben no it's been elbow high like if you look at someone posted this or mentioned in the broadcast he isn't just getting unlucky allowing runs people are crushing him and the metrics will show you that like exit velocities off of taiwan walker are well above league average He is just I, – I really do not think he is a good pitcher anymore. Well, he's getting paid a lot of money, so. $18 million this year. Not just the year after that. The year after that, too. We have three more years of him. I mean, Walker's ERA is almost as much as he's getting paid this year. It's not good, Kyle. I mean, it is what it is. Something that is good, though. Christopher Sanchez, nearly a two ERA in May. He looks, I mean, he looks really good. Yeah. And we've seen him. We've seen him develop. Um, he's he. he I, I kind of like what Ruben. I don't love all the things Ruben Amaro says, but. He said yesterday on the broadcast, we saw him starting just throw the ball, and he's developed into a starting pitcher. And he has. The velocity is there. There's a lot more movement. Six innings of score this ball in San Francisco is not easy. That outfield is big. Yeah. There's a lot of ground. Now, the Phillies are lucky. They've got you know two above-average outfielders and i'll even call nick castellanos an average outfielder um i swear he gets like discriminated against with those like the defensive run save metric because he is the worst on the team by far and i feel like he really has not been that bad and i know there are balls that drop in front of him that guys like rojas might be able to make a sliding grab to get but I don't that's know. why he I plays right field right and i i don't know i felt like he was, he's covered his ground okay like, I am not saying he should win a gold glove or be even remotely close to winning a gold glove, but I think that he has, he's been fine. I know everyone, all adults hate the word fine, but I think he's been, you know, by the dictionary, I think he's been fine. Yeah, and Christopher Sanchez has been, I mean, what have you seen from his development from last year to now? We, now it looks like he's a guy that you can absolutely trust in October. Um, I mean, this rotation is just outside of Tywin Walker. I mean, these guys are just pitchers. Sanchez, if you're back, let's start with your first question. Sanchez, he's trusting his gut more. And the catchers have handled him really, really well. Um, I saw him a couple, two starts ago. First pitch, swing and a miss to change up. Swing and a miss at a changeup. Third pitch, swing and a miss at a changeup. Like, he never would have done that a year ago or two years ago or maybe even earlier this season. But he recognizes the weakness in a hitter, and instead of trying to – and he's not tr- – this is it, really. He's not trying to be perfect. And I think uh, this is, you know, call me crazy, but I think a lot of it is job security. He knows he has a spot in the rotation. He knows that he can afford making one or two mistakes – and because he's not trying to be perfect and, you know, be 100% an ace, I think he's actually been more efficient and able to get quicker outs. And, you know, he's more willing to attack hitters because he's not afraid of allowing that solo home run, the two-run home run of walking a guy than he was last year because he knew one bad start and he is back to the bullpen 
or back down to Lehigh Valley. And that mindset is gone because he has, you know, he has job security. Because if Sanchez isn't in there, I don't know who they're going to put in there. Turnbull's not stretched out anymore. He can really only go three innings at this point. So Sanchez has a job, and I think his mindset's changed. And because of this changed mindset, he approaches his opponent differently. And, you know, it's it's game-changing for him. Yeah, he's that is something I – he's trusting his stuff a lot more. And yeah, um, that's that's, that's been his biggest. That's been the biggest thing with him. He's right. started trusting his stuff, and his stuff's been really good. And someone else who's been really good, Matt Strom, now leads now leads all relievers in FIP. Ha, did not allow a run in May. I mean, all star. He has to be. I know we talked about this on the last podcast, or maybe it was two podcasts ago. They all blend together. Um, you know. Any more guys, they don't have flashy stuff. They're not touching 99 with their fastball. They don't have a slider that starts in the top right of the zone and ends in the bottom left of the zone. They're not getting all-star nods. But at this point, it's hard to justify not putting Strom on the all-star team. He has – I've never seen maybe 2022 Jose Alvarado in, like, September might be the only – comparable thing that I can think of. I don't know if there's anything else that compares to what I've seen from Strong. And because that Alvarado was absurd. Like he didn't I, I don't know. His cutter was gross at that point. He was all around the strike zone. He was touching like 101. Um, but I've, I've never seen anyone just be as dominant as Strom has been over the last month and a half. It is not the whole season, really. He had not a lot of runs since opening day, right? I think that's correct. Uh, yeah. But that's, He's like that's a point eight ridiculous. ERA, I think. It's by the time you like this video gets posted, you decide to click on it, watch the whole thing and think about it. It's going to be June. And he has, has a lot of runs since opening day. He's pitched in 23 games since then. Is yeah, that right? There. I don't know if you have his numbers up. 23 I games, I think, since opening day, somewhere in that ballpark. It's ridiculous. There's there's no way to describe it. It's surreal. Yeah, Matt Strom has pitched in 23 games, so 22. Look at me. Um, He's done 22 in a third innings. He's 32 strikeouts. A point seven six whip, point eight one ERA, and yeah, hasn't allowed a run and you allowed two on opening day. That's it. That's pretty crazy. good, pretty good. Um, let's yeah. let's look forward. Our next pod is when I think before the London series. So we have yeah. two series to look at. A little homestand for the Phillies. We'll start in May as we come to an end. Oh, I can't read that. In the month. What a month of May for the Philadelphia Phillies. Look at all these yeah. W's. Lots of W's. Lots of W's. So we start um June 31st or May 31st, excuse me. Um is the beginning of the Cardinals series. And then we flip the calendar to June and look at that. Two more against the Cardinals. And then three against the Milwaukee Brewers. So a three Six game homestand um, with the Cardinals and Brewers before they head out to London. And that June 1st, double, how about that? Double decker London bus. That's exciting. And I mean, if you're going to the game, you didn't purchase a ticket. It's the Philly Sports Sports game at the bank is on June 1st. Um, if you're going to be down there, we're going to have a tailgate. Um, I can pull that up now. Uh, it's going to be on 7th and Packer. Um, is the lot, uh, in like the back corner of the lot is where we'll be. Here we go. Let's, let's share this step instead. We get underway at 1030. Here's the ballpark. This is where we will be. You enter through here, Packer Avenue, 7th Street. Um, okay. it's going to be a good time. We get started there at 430. We walk over to the ballpark. We'll see when that happens. Uh, and then we'll be up in 301 is where we'll be with the Fandemic crew. Ranger Suarez nice. is pitching too, Colin. Rangers, Rangers will be in full effect up there. You're going to learn the dance. Nice. 
I have a jersey. Get... I have a Ranger Suarez powder blue. You, you should get Athens, the uh, China. You should. Yeah, it's good stuff. You should get the Power Ranger. Bucks. You should get the Power Ranger costume. You can match with everybody. Mm. I actually am not totally sure what a Power Ranger is. I'm gonna have to Google that. You don't um, know what a Power. I wasn't really into that kind of stuff as a child. You should still know what really a Power. You should still know what a Power. Are Ranger. they? The... No wait. They're not the ones who transform, right? They're... Oh, they're the. That's the Transformers. Yeah, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Like I could. Right. Are they colorful Power Rangers? Yeah, they just have their own like color. A... Okay, I, I think I know what you're talking about. They're like, uh, I didn't really watch Power Rangers either. They're like Was it a Rangers. game or a show? It was a show. Okay. There you go. This is the Power Rangers. It was kind of before us a little bit. They're ugly looking. It's like 90s. Okay. Gotcha. Still a lot of our generation watch it, though. Um... So six go, games. I'll go three and three. Three and well, three. Well, I mean, it's actually a, a tough stretch here because you've got the hot hand in the Cardinals. They've won eight of their last ten, um, and I think like mm, it's two straight. But I think it's also they've won seven of their last eight. Mm -hmm. I want to say um, they've been playing pretty good baseball recently. Their offense has somewhat come together. Um, and, you know, the Brewers, they lead the NL Central by a pretty wide margin. They're 10 games over 500. So I think they'll take – I'll give them four and two. That's what I was going to say. I'll give them four and two. I think they'll take two from both teams. They'll lose the night we're there just because no. that's how the cookie crumbles usually. No. No? Okay, then fine, fine, fine. They'll lose whatever game Nola pitches. They'll They're lose. not losing with Ranger out there. They lost. They did that earlier. Oh, you're right. That's gonna. Ha that has to be a win. When does Nola? They'll lose the Taiwan Walker. They'll lose the Taiwan Walker game yeah. on Sunday Night Baseball. Oh, um, oh no, 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 no. Walker and Sunday Night Baseball. He pitches after Ranger, right? Covering that game. What? I'm covering that game, right? Yes. I can start writing that article now. That's an easy one. <laughs> and the Brewers, the third through the fifth, Reese Hoskins returns to Philadelphia for the first time. Will he play? Eh, probably not. On the IL. I think it's a hamstring. Maybe. Um, I hope he brings out the lineup card. Shakes hand with that. That would be cool. Rob. They'll do They'll do some sort of something for him. They did something for Michael Lorenzen. They'll show a video. But, yeah, I have them four and two. I think they'll take two from both. I think they lose that Sunday night game, and then I think they probably lose the getaway game against Milwaukee before they go to London. So they're in line sunglasses. Then? Look at this. Sun London sunglasses on Wednesday. It's kind of blurry. I like my own sunglasses. So Saturday they're Let's doing the, the bus. Who's that for? Is that for everybody? Oh, Children, God. Colin. You can get away as a fourteen-year-old. Yeah, they'll. So they usually they just hand them out to anyone who looks like they're young. So. And then these are the sunglasses. Presented by S E I. Wonder if they're UV protected. <laughs> Probably not. Um. No. Before we stop this, before we are done. Um. The Mets have hit rock bottom. Like the, I've never seen the Mets lower than this in my lifetime. Since 2007. Um, we're going to play the clip from what transpired yesterday. This is via SNY. Carlos Mendoza said that he understands the emotion, but that that particular action of throwing your glove into the stands was unacceptable. Looking back on it, do you regret doing that? No. no I, don't, I don't regret it. Uh, I think I've been looking the worst team in probably in the whole MLB. So, you know, whatever happened, happened. So... Whatever they want to do, it. I'll be tomorrow here if they want me. You know, whatever they want to do. So, I'll, I'm gonna keep doing this thing. You know, so I'm healthy on whatever. You know, on whatever to do. You know, I'm I'm ready to come back tomorrow if they want me to be here. So I'll be here. Lopez was DFA shortly after this. Yeah. He was ejected. 
threw his glove into the crowd. Mets didn't like it. DFA'd. Said he was on the worst effing team in the MLB. Then the later said that teammate. he was on the worst. That was the initial report, and then he came back and said he was the worst teammate. Um, so kind of. Well, said, no, no, I thought he said he. I thought he said both. Didn't he say both? Let's I, let's rewatch it. Carlos Mendoza said that he understands the emotion, but that that particular action of throwing your glove into the stands was unacceptable. Looking back on it, do you regret? doing that no no i don't i don't regret it uh i think i've been looking the worst team in probably in the whole mlb so you know whatever happened happened so i don't know i think it's funny that he just you know <laughs> uh colin's audio cut out we'll try and get him back but i mean and this is just as metsy as it getsy. It doesn't get more metsy than this. Um, they've hit a new bottom, and I've enjoyed watching it. Colin's audio is messed up, and I know he's enjoyed watching it. Um, Colin, have we got you? Oh, no. I don't think we have. I think we might have lost Colin. But anyway, we're we're at, we're done. Um, that's all we got for today. Mets are gonna met. Collins Mike is gonna Mike. Um, we'll be back with you before the London series. We're talking about this homestand. You can follow Colin and I both on X. You can also follow the Beverly's podcast on X. Read us both at phillysportsports.com. Follow Philly Sports Sports on all social media. And thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring the app. Use code Philly Sports Report to save $20 off your first purchase. Colin would say the whole DS, but I'll say it for him. P H I L L Y S P O R T S R E P O R T to save. We'll be back with you next week. Go Phil's Mets Stink.